All right, we're going to see if anybody's awake. Are you ready? Good morning. Hey, you guys are awake, so you must have went to bed an hour earlier last night, probably, I'm guessing, or we may have to sing some folks in, because it looks like maybe they forgot to change their clocks, but, <laughs> so we may have an influx at about 1030, oh, <laughs> but it's good, I'm glad that you were able to, to get some rest, be able to uh, come to the Lord's house this morning and to worship together, that's what we plan on doing, that's what we are going to do, so let's go ahead and prepare to do that. Uh, if you'll please, let's stand together. I'm going to share with you Psalm 86.10, and then we're going to start singing How Great Thou Art. Psalm 86.10 says, You are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. How great thou art. My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think. That God his son not sparing Sent him to die I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin Then sinks my soul My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Turn to your neighbor and tell them good morning.
We're going to continue singing as we sing the last verse together. Here we go. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. Worshiping together, Lord, I lift your name on high. <laughs> Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. So glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we do lift your name on high, singing praises to you, Lord. And we thank you so much, Father, that we're able to gather here and to do so freely. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, who paid the price for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that you raised him again and that we serve a risen Savior today. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that as believers in Christ has been immersed into him, that we have your spirit, your Holy Spirit living inside of us. And Father, I just pray this morning that your spirit move, guide, and direct, and convict. That Father, if anyone doesn't know you as their personal Savior, they take the opportunity this morning to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what my heart's long for 
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare, you're my living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord all the people said Amen. You can be seated. Continuing to worship, remembering each and every week what Christ did on Calvary for our sins as we prepare for communion. Let's be singing, There's Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus for my pardon. Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing, this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow Oh, no other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done, 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So it is kind of kind of nice when you pick the songs and you have the communion meditation because you can kind of relate them very well. So I kind of wanted to uh, start off with reading 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 through 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. It's not near as long as it sounds. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The song we just sang, Nothing But the Blood. It says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Verse 3 says, nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can atone for our sins or could atone for our sins. Only his sacrifice was good enough to save us. That's what we remember at communion time. That's why we take this time every single week because it's that important. It's important to remember how much Jesus was willing to give how much he loves us because he was willing to die and how much God loves us because he was willing to give his one and only son. I'll wrap it up with this. The first two verses of 1 John chapter 2 again. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for the gift of your son who shed his blood and died a horrifying death on the cross that we might live eternally. We thank you that we have this opportunity to gather around this table weekly to celebrate that act that he did on that cross. We pray that you will help each one of us to focus our attention totally on that cross 
and what Jesus did thereon as we partake of these emblems, which are uh, symbolic of his body and blood. We thank you also that you have provided us a country where we have the freedom to come here and worship you on a weekly basis and especially without fear or persecution. In the name of your Son, we offer this prayer. Amen. Let's continue to worship together. Let's stand as we sing together, Jesus, Messiah. <laughs> That we might become his righteousness. He stumbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Name above all. Lord of all, his body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love, the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn, love so amazing, love so amazing. Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. seated. Good morning. I looked up the definition of offering for today and I picked two out. First was a thing offered especially as a gift or contribution. And the, the fourth definition was a thing offered as a religious sacrifice or token of devotion. And those two ideas two definitions gave me a couple ideas. One, found a little odd, but both used offered. I didn't think you were allowed to use the word in the definition. <laughs> but 
I thought it was a good reminder that we're choosing to give at this time, or we're choosing to give our time throughout the week. It may be expected, like the sacrifices of the Old Testament, but at the end of the day, no one can make you give your money or use your time a certain way. You still have to be willing to give an offering, otherwise it's not. The second idea came from the fourth definition, the idea of being an offering being a token of devotion. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Think of yourself or anyone really that you know, this verse rings true. I know I spend my time and my money on the things that matter to me. This is a time when we can show that God is our treasure. And then finally, token of devotion really fits nice with what U67 has been doing on Sunday nights. We're going through James, listening to Francis Chan as he kind of explains some of that for us. James 1, 22 to 24 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. To show our devotion to Christ and the way that he showed us that we should be living, we have to be willing to go and do. There are plenty of verses about giving and doing throughout the Bible a lot of them in James that U67 will see tonight in the next couple nights. This time is really just the first opportunity that you have to show your devotion. As you go through the week, look for the times that you can show Christ's love to others, which again is doing what he commands in the book. Let's go to him in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to partake in this offering and in your work. Uh, please bless the gifts that are given and bless those that give. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, at this time this morning, we are mindful of day-to-day -day things in life, uh, things that change and, and things that we think remain the same. But Father, we know that every morning is... Uh, a new morning with you. We know that there are those who are uh, waking up today to new experiences that are devastating and tragic and they are hurting and filled with pain. And Father, we know that there are opportunities for us to come alongside, to be mindful in our prayers, to lift up our family and friends, our loved ones, uh, people in this nation and around the world who are um, in need of aid and healing and strength, maybe finances, uh, shelter. Uh, Father, we know that there are so many ways that we can help and provide. Thank you for the luxuries, uh, the blessings, uh, the possessions, all that is so readily available to us individually and as a church family. Thank you for the generosity and the sacrifice in the past and we just pray that we can continue to be strengthened and encouraged enriched by our time together whether it's uh, Sunday morning through the week um, our interactions and communications may we continue to find our own source and strength in your word as we study it read it uh, pray over it internalize it every day thank you for your truth that endures it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and we're finishing up, especially if you're new or first time, we're finishing up like a 10-week look at this partnership that's listed there for you on the back of the insert. <clears throat> we made our way down the left side, and then we're coming now, obviously, to the end of the right side. And you can kind of see some across the way when we finish up talking about our individual responsibilities. At the end, it's the same as... Number four on the left side, serving in the church. And that's whether we're serving as a church uh, collectively, as a whole body on the same issue, or it might be one or two or just a group of people that are serving independently. We, we need to be serving. That, that there is power in service. I read when the communists took over Russia in 1917, they vigorously persecuted the church, but they didn't make Christianity illegal. So when they wrote their constitution in 1918, Article 13 guaranteed freedom of religion. 
But Article 16 establishes that only the Soviet Republic would render, quote, material and all other assistance to the workers and the poorest peasants. They effectively made it illegal for the church to serve, to, to do good works. Uh, Rick Rousseau and Eric Swanson wrote the book, The Externally Focused Church. They said, because the church in Russia could no longer feed the hungry or take care of the sick or the orphans, within 70 years it was irrelevant in culture. Take away service and you take away the church's power, influence, evangelistic effectiveness, etc. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the Romans. Chapter 15, verse 17, contemporary English version. Because of Christ Jesus, I can take pride in my service for God. In fact, I will, all I will talk about is how Christ let me speak and work so that the Gentiles would obey him. Jesus, how many times we have, Jesus was a servant. He led by serving, Luke twenty two twenty seven. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. The power of serving. You see that little blurb on the outline. Uh, Serving the Lord can take place. It might be within these walls. It could also be without. Serving in here at the church. And and, and periodically, usually about every fall, we revisit this ministry fair concept. And we give you a list of opportunities. Say, here are all the various areas where you can serve within the church. And I'll keep going over this. We keep trying to ingrain this. Not all of those are visible. You don't have to be on stage to lead. Some, like some of the elders and deacons, are more visible. You see more things they do on stage. Some behind the scenes. (laughs) There's a great story that came. uh, Jason Amit serving in the role of a deacon before we asked him to serve as a deacon. And the lady that it happened to told me, she said, you know, there's a Sunday I was coming in. And it was one of those Sundays where the sun had melted off the pavement. It was nice and safe. But the steps coming up right there still had a glaze on. We didn't know it. And this lady was actually talking to Ben and Jason. She said, I almost fell. She said, you know what Ben and Jason did? They went and got salt and fixed a problem. You know, serving as a deacon, as a father, teaching the son that's how you serve. And that's, they're not the only guys I could, I could probably go around the room and pick out and Tell stories. How many people have served in how many ways in the church? And I've been saving this. I know this is very tiny, but I'll put a picture up there. You know what this little cog is? See that up there? See the, see the one tooth broke off of the, you know what this is? This is the gear. This is the cog that powered or operated, made it so that the front door lock worked on this whole building. And it got locked, and we couldn't get, we couldn't get in. You know, here's all this service and all these people and all this facility. I had to keep running around to another door because one tooth. And the locksmith gave me this. He said, there's what broke. Made the whole thing inaccessible. Everybody matters. You know, there's an old hymn, 424. It's called the Servant Song. There, Brother, sister, let me serve you. It says, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. I'll hold the Christ light for you in the nighttime of your fear. I'll weep with you. I'll laugh with you. Various service. So we can all kind of check, what's my level of church service currently? Entry level is what? Entry level is showing up when you're supposed to work. <laughs> um, I signed up to ministry fair. I'm in the nursery. I got a rotation. It's my Sunday. I sit back there, 9:25 or so till 11:45. Uh, I teach Sunday school. It starts roughly about 11. I teach till 11:30. That that's entry level. I do what I'm asked to do when I'm asked to do it. Great. A lot of people do it. What's the next level? Working ahead, right? Preparing ahead of my slated hour, being sure I have, and in the church, we will do everything we can to supply you and equip you and have everything ready. I can't do it when you come in at 9.25 on Sunday morning and say, oh, I need it. Too late. Uh, copier, technology. It, we're going to have breakfast. This is four one. We're going to have Easter breakfast in a few weeks, right? It's going to start about 7.30. We can't be going, who <laughs> forgot the donuts? It's too late. You, know, you got to look that up ahead of time. And cups and plates and all that stuff, and Jeff Barrett will go get whatever we need, but we have to look it up ahead of time and go in there and say, hey, Jeff, go get more plates. You know, and I understand things break. I get that. Technology has a mind of its own. Right? 
We, we work every Sunday to make sure that all this stuff is prepared and ready to go, and that thing might choose to freeze mid-service. I understand that. Emily, Derek, people, they know how to fix it. They go on and work, but I'm not talking about that. That's not lack of preparation. You know, I'm just caution. Don't, I can't come in here two minutes before, oh, you know, something's wrong. I can't do anything about it Sunday morning. You know, and I wrestle with this because I facilitated this. You know, there's been a lot of times when I'll just do it. You know, I'll just get everything right. I'll just make everything ready. I just put you that picture because Jesus, if Jesus was willing to wash people's feet, then there shouldn't be anything that I am unwilling to do in service and equipment, right? And then I turn over and I read in Acts 6 where Peter and John are looking at a legitimate need where people need food, and they look at it and they say, we don't have time to do that. We'll find some other people who are capable and gifted in the Spirit, and we'll focus over here on praying and preaching. So I, I ask, pray for me, because I'm in the middle, you know, trying to understand what do I balance, what do I give up, what do I chase, when do I chastise. You know, there's, there's a lot of valuable service that happens in here on Sunday or in here through the week. And I pray that all of us can see, contribute, share. It's all important. It's worthwhile. It matters. And I still maintain that some and maybe a majority of our service efforts through the week, these spiritual conversations that we have in 7, 8, and 9, it's going to be out there. It's going to be beyond these walls. You know, we've, we've had these nine arts that we've gone through, and the beauty of these is you don't need me for any of this. You do not need me sitting there next to you to, where we, you know, to notice was the first one. We, and I appreciate Peter Markley generating these. Noticing, praying, listening, asking questions, loving, being welcoming. None of those are dependent on a church-wide program. You know, oh, we don't have a sign-up sheet for that. Not, it's discipleship month. You know, we're, we're, we're going through the final three arts. Anybody can practice this through the week. If I want to be a disciple who's making disciples, number seven out of the nine is facilitating. What does it mean to facilitate? Like Derek, I look up the definition. What's it mean to facilitate? To make easier or less difficult. What am I trying to facilitate? I, I, I'm a disciple. I'm trying to make another disciple. What do I want to make easier? What do I want to make less difficult? That person being able to learn about Jesus. How can I make it easier for my neighbor or my coworker to learn about Jesus? I want to facilitate that. And very early in the gospel, in John 1, 35, John the Baptist is standing there with two of his disciples, and he points over and says, hey, look, there's Jesus. There's the Lamb of God right there. And his two disciples, they just go and they start following Jesus. And he turns around and he's like, what do you want? And they say, where are you going to stay? We want to spend the day. And Jesus invites them. Come and you will see. And he invites them to come along for three years. And he facilitates them learning. He makes it easier for them to see what he's about. How did I make it less difficult for a coworker or a neighbor to see Jesus last week? I'm reading some of the, the modern educational um, one of the concepts is the flipped classroom. As, as I understand it, it's not, it used to be, they said it used to be the teacher would stand up and, and give the information initially, a lecture or teaching, what have you. When they flip it, as I read it, they said that the student is charged to go out and either on a video or some other way, you initially are exposed to it outside the classroom. And when we come into the class, then the teacher and the students will work together, will work side by side to unpack, answer questions. That, that's a current twist on the age-old, how do I engage the listener? You know, that, that's, that's one of the hardest parts of preaching to a group. <laughs> I, have to, I depend on God to help connect this and make this personal. in every Because it'd be easier if we just sit down one-on-one, -on -one, what do we want to talk about, have questions, but obviously we don't have time or space for that's not feasible with 100 people. You know? So we're taking all these steps. I'm trying to get closer to a potential disciple. I want to facilitate. I want to help them figure it out for themselves. Scottish theologian William Barclay pointed it out this way. It is only when truth is self-discovered that it is appropriated. When a man is simply told the truth, it remains external to him. He can quite easily forget it. When he is led to discover the truth for himself, 
it becomes an integral part of him, and he never forgets it. And we have all been there. If you're a parent, coach, teacher, mentoring someone, facilitating is messy. <laughs> it takes time. You have to be patient. It's a whole lot easier for me to just do it. You sit there and I'll do it. But are we going to remember that? I've, I've fished. I've fished in ponds with a number of younger kids. It's always easier for me to just do it. You know, I'll bait the hook. I'll tie the knot. I'll cast the line. I'll take a fish off. Let me just do it. Because the more I involve the kids, the less fishing I actually get done. Because <laughs> all you do is tangles and snags. And, but the more involved they are in all the aspects, the more able they are to fish on their own the next time when I'm not around. Right? You hook your own finger a time or two. You learn. Facilitate. Come alongside. Picture Philip, the disciple, in Acts chapter 8, and the Lord tells him, go to this desert road, go south, just start walking. And he sees a chariot, that this chariot has the Ethiopian eunuch in it, and the Spirit says, run alongside. So he goes up and sees this guy reading, and, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And, and what does the eunuch say? How can I? Unless somebody explains it to me. So he invites Philip up. And they're now riding together, and this is how it unfolds in Acts 8.34. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And the fear in this might be what? <laughs> what if I don't know what that particular passage says about Jesus? I have to remember, I'm here as a facilitator. We're not professors. They're not expecting everybody to have a theology degree on the wall. I'm a fellow disciple. We're, we're going to come alongside. We'll figure this out together. And, and I will grant you that one-on-one, -on -one, especially initially, this, this can be intimidating. So if you have a chance to bring a fellow Christian alongside, do that. There's nothing says we can't work on this as a team. You know? I would encourage, if you, if you have the blessing of husband and wife together in the faith, if you could invite somebody together to go out to eat. And you could have something in your home. We have all the right now media tools. You know, working together, we'll, we'll, that'll draw you closer too in the process. You know, I always appreciate having somebody with me on a visit. Jesus did not send the disciples one by one. He said, you guys go two by two. And, you talk, and we're talking about serving in a church. This is where facilitating a group, whether it's a, a women's Bible study on Thursday, the guys that just met at um, Bob Evans in the morning, uh, Sunday school, youth group. That's why we use that term, youth group. You like to have a group. You can have one, but it puts a lot of pressure on the one kid to answer every question. <laughs> it's nice to have a group of people. And, and at the same time, it's nice to have a reasonable group. If you have 100 people, again, not everybody gets to speak and comment and ask questions and interact. So, and we're, we're all the way now to step seven, eight, and nine. And, and the figures that Peter has drawn for us by seven, eight, and nine, they're, they're engaged. You know, they're right in the middle and they're interacting. And I understand you might, could still be a little hesitant on this whole disciple making conversation. You know? Do a test run on something easy, something pertinent to your group. Next time you're with your group, uh, you know, three or four sitting around lunch table, riding in a car, after a game, talking about it. Facilitate a conversation about anything. It could be about high State, football, music, something easy. Facilitate a... And your goal initially is what? Get everybody to engage. Facilitate so that everybody contributes. Once you get that down, then you step it up, next level, take a tougher conversation. could be coronavirus, anything political, moral issue facilitate that, which is what? I want everybody to contribute, and now I want everybody to be heard. <laughs> you can't just have everybody, can I facilitate it to, this is not, here, let me lecture you everything I know about Jesus. You know, what questions do you have? Can we figure these out together? And, and one of the easiest, one of the most natural ways or times to facilitate is number eight, serving. Serving together. Just simply invite somebody to Work on a project with you. Maybe you're helping somebody move. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, right? Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. How many times have you served someone? And I'll give you a minute because I know it's a lot. Try to count. How many times have you served, taken them food, worked in their yard, driven somewhere, covered for them at work, filled in while they were sick? How many times? There's a whole range. Well done. You know, God is pleased. How many times have I served with someone? alongside them, invited them to come do the work with me. This, this, this is the difference between rock and jump and deck building. And a couple of things last summer, right? Last summer I took the kids to the trampoline park on the left, and they, I think they had fun, and they jumped, and they bounced, and what did I do? I stood there and watched, took pictures. And then the very next month, that same group of kids comes out here and put this deck on the side of this, those two doors right in the room. And they interacted, and some of them learned how to use a drill, and some of them learned how to not whack people in the head with boards. And, you know, that's, and, and <clears throat> there's no prize for this. There was no reward other than the service and lessons. Now, now, which of these two events allows me the most time to pour into the kids? Building the deck. And, when it just, and the discipleship stuff just happens as a side note, you know, along the process, when you're not focused on it. Tell me, remember the saying, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. You know, when the book pointed out how many m notable scenes in the Gospels where Jesus asked people to participate with him in something. <laughs> they don't even know who he is. They don't even know what they're involved in. He has the, the wedding, and they run out of wine. And, and Jesus gets these servants, and he says, go fill these giant jars, you know, like 30 gallons. Don't fill those jars with water. They have no idea, probably even, who he is or certainly what he's about to do. But they're involved. You know? The Samaritan woman, we've talked about her, John 4. He asked her for a drink. He's, he's involving her in the process. He told this one lame man to carry his mat, and a blind man, when he put some mud on his eyes, he said, go wash it. You know, remember all the people gathered at the tomb, Lazarus' tomb? He's going to tell all these mourners, what, I need you to move the stone, and then this guy's going to come out, and I need you to, they're involved. A special bond is formed when you pursue a common cause with someone, and people who seem the least interested in discussing God and the Bible might jump at the chance to come with you to serve at a food pantry, assist in disaster relief, join a community recycling project. Serving together invites people into a relational involvement. They belong. They see, they hear Christianity, the gospel being lived out. And we're starting to try to facilitate this with the Alexandria community, right? Could have been, in years past, been, we will build a playground for you, which became come help us build this, and people came to help. The difference between we will host a carnival for you and come and work with us to put on a carnival. And people, there's some people in that picture who are not members of this church. You know? and, you, and you have to be mindful of that because in the work times, right, in the serving times, when the, I'm not conscious that I'm discipling someone times, that's when you have to pray, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Please let the fruits of your spirit be evident in my life because I'm working with my friends. Right? You're helping your neighbor build a garage. What's going to happen? There's potential. You could hit your own thumb with a hammer. Right? And what's well, going to come flying out? <laughs> and sometimes you have to admit, I'm not there yet. No, I'm still, I am a disciple being discipled. Work in progress. Jesus makes it very clear. John 15, you have to rely on his power. He is the root. He is the vine. We are the branches. We get our nourishment and our strength from him. Can't stress this enough. I'm, if I'm working with lost people that I'm trying to influence, I can't be whining and griping and complaining the whole time I'm doing this good deed. <laughs> it, it's not a good deed anymore. The Nine Arts book had this quote, a boring, lifeless, critical, or stress-filled Christian is hardly going to make an outsider thirsty for that kind of life. And I understand, none of us are going to be perfect. We are all a work in progress. I just don't want to scare you out of attempting. No. Jesus asked Philip in John 6, remember that? There's 5,000 men 
and their families, all hungry. And Jesus surveys that, looks Philip, and says, where are we going to get something to feed all these people? Right? And Jesus knows what he's going to do, right? <laughs> Philip doesn't know. And Philip, he panics. <laughs> I think all he can think is Panera. You know, it's like, where are we going? It's like, there's not one close. You know, I, I don't know what we're going to do. Where are we going to get bread for all these people? And, and he can't see past that little brown paper bag, but what does Jesus do with Philip and all the disciples? He involves them in what he's about to do. Here, guys, what I need you to do. Go tell everybody to sit down in groups. Here's this food. I'm going to bless it. You hand it out. After they've all eaten it, you pick it up. And being hands-on involved in that helps them learn a whole lot about relying on Jesus. You know? and, and nuts and bolts in this, if, if I'm going to invite somebody to a project, uh, work on a project with me, these might be some good steps. Now, the first one in that list would be, I want to invite in person, if, if possible. And social media is great, and there's all kinds of tools, but sometimes if you can face-to-face with your friend, be specific. Have you have I ever done this? Hey, you want to help me with my church work sometime? Versus, I'm going to be at Lifeline in Westerville on East Wind Drive, Saturday, from probably 9 to 11. You know, we're going to pack food for kids in Haiti. Uh, let's have lunch afterwards. We'll go up on 3 somewhere in Westerville and have lunch. Specific. You know. Do your homework. Because you know, if, if I've been listening to my coworkers, I notice what they do. Uh, I'm going to invite them to something I think they're either passionate about or at least capable. It says make sure you address any safety concerns. Don't invite somebody to cut wood with you and then hand somebody this big heavy chainsaw if they can't hold it and don't know how to use it. You know? Be mindful. Be prepared. Have the stuff ready. If you're going to invite somebody to do something, I'm going to have the materials ready. We will do a quality job. You know, it's working for the Lord, not for men. Um, nobody wants to be a part of a service project with some church and you go home, what'd you do? Man, we built this sketchy ramp for somebody with a wheelchair. I don't know. That's, and when we're done... Talk about it. Debrief, eat, question. What would you think? you like it? Was it what you expected? And I, I think this is a very subtle one-word addition to serving. Because I know this church body has been very capable serving, doing for people for decades. Serving with them, inviting them, that, that's a powerful invitation. And the last of these, nine then, is the art of sharing. And I thought Peter did a perfect job. This is not sharing food. Um, This this is not sharing toys. Um, It's sharing my faith. Saying the words. Talking about Jesus. I can can always hear my professor, R.J. Kidwell, evangelism class. The gospel has not been shared until a response has been asked for. You know, and, that, and that's why this is number nine in a list. You can see all those footprints. We've come this far. This is the time. I'm going to actually talk about Jesus. And you, ha- and you have to be prepared anywhere along, right? First Peter 3.15, but in your hearts set apart Christ Jesus as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to get... You can't be stuck and, you know, oh, this is only step four. Don't ask me. No, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you have to be ready anywhere along. But I think, I think if I know this group like I think I do. Um, number eight, serving, doing for people. We're really good at that. That's easier. Nine, that's tougher. You know, talking. You know, talking about Jesus and, and whoever you are, whatever your experience, public speaking confidence, no matter. I hope we want to tell people what Jesus has done. I hope that we have, love should compel us Love compels us to say, I love this person. I do not want him or her to spend eternity in hell. I have a love for them that makes me want to communicate this. Jesus has met my greatest need. Whatever it is, even if we're in the midst of it right now, I know no matter how much everybody else has done, no one's done more for me than God, who's greater comfort and power in my life than God. I want to share that. Jesus Christ is, is the relationship I have with God. Christ is the most valuable thing I could give you. That guy in the parable that sees the pearl in the field and he sells everything else he has to go buy the field and get that pearl because this is the most precious thing. I would hope, I believe that Jesus is the greatest gift I could give anybody. Do I really want to go through all nine of these steps just so I can get an opportunity and then teach somebody how to swing a golf club? 
which I wish I could do better, but that's not the end game. You know? Let me help you learn how to work your camera better. Well, that's fine, but that's not this. You know? Let me share with you about Jesus. And I don't want to be afraid of this. I hope we don't make it harder than it has to be. Um, in that one list, I referenced Jesus inviting a blind man to be a part of the process. And he was the guy, it was in John chapter 9. He's, he's born blind, and his disciples were with Jesus. And they notice him, and they say, whose fault is this, that this guy's blind? And Jesus says, it's nobody's fault. This is so that the work of God can be displayed in his life. <clears throat> and Jesus makes a little bit of mud, puts it on his eyes, tells him to go wash, and the guy goes home, scene, great story, end of story, no. Because he starts walking around, and everybody's looking. Isn't that the blind guy? Nah, it just looks like the blind guy. <laughs> He's like, number one, I'm not deaf. I can hear you talking about me. You know? And number two, I can actually see you now. And yeah, I'm the guy. You know, they say, how did this happen? He's like, Jesus made mud. Put... Well, where'd Jesus go? He's like, I don't know. I was still blind at the time. <laughs> he left while I was going to wash. But he said, so they take him to the Pharisees because they're like the miracle police. You know? and, and this happened on Saturday. And day of rest. And they, they, what happened to you? And he tells the story again. Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. I went to see. Like, nah, we don't know if it's true. And they, so they, now they bring his parents in. Remember that? They involve his parents. Is this your son? Yeah, he's our son. Is he born? Yeah. And then they parents, don't involve us. We don't want to know. Just ask him. So they grill him again. You know, Give glory to God. This is Jesus. And they start running down Jesus. In verse 29, John 9, 25, the guy says, One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. And I don't care who we are or what our past is or how old you are. All of us can have that 12-word testimony about Jesus. I was this. Now I'm this. You know? And if you've, been, if you've brought up in the church, say, I've always known Jesus, then you say, I've always been this. Praise the Lord, I don't have any experience in that. This is what it has blessed me with. You know? And I understand, sometimes we don't get a ton, maybe a ton of opportunities to share our faith, but if it's going to come, and you've done all this work and taken all these nine steps, you get the opportunity to take it. This is a privilege. You know. How do I do it? I don't know. Share my story. Be brief. Can you tell the whole thing in two minutes? hundred words. Leave them wanting more. You don't want somebody, oh man, I wish he'd never started talking. You know. Be brief. Be clear. Don't, don't tell Weird stories, complicated storylines. Derek knows I'm always fussing when some of the shows have alternate universes. I just get lost. You know, just be clear. Um, use common language, ordinary language. There are a lot of church terms. Born again, relationship with Jesus. Out of this context, they might not know what you're talking about. Be humble. Sometimes it, Christians unknowingly, we come across as like superior when we're telling our story. And please, please, don't, don't run down the church. Um, don't criticize other Christians. You know? and, and you might be listening to all this going, that's great, I, just, I, I don't know what to say. I don't have enough material. I sent you this week in email form four classic time-tested illustrations. Um, God as a good judge. You know, picture what would a good judge do if a criminal was guilty and how he would act if he was a parent, etc. Um, do a lot of people say, what do I need to do to be saved? Versus done. You write an N and an E after do. This is what Jesus has already done. Uh, the bridge, you got God on this side and us on this side, and there's that chasm and the cross makes a bridge. Um, Jesus, in the, Jesus take the wheel, <laughs> the Carrie Underwood illustration. You know, um, you all know what it is to, to ride in a car versus drive a car. And if you say, I got to write that down, there's, there's paper copies out there on the table if you need to take one today. I'm at the ninth step. You know, sharing the gospel. I don't, I don't want to be afraid of this. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, of self-discipline. Love, God's love. 1 John 4.18, There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. I'm sharing my story, my testimony, the Lord. I, I, I trust we want to. Can I be willing? These arts... These spiritual conversations open those doors. Noticing, praying, listening, asking questions, loving, welcoming, facilitating, serving together, and the opportunity to share. Sharing my faith, 
sharing the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful that you have chosen us. Each disciple, but a disciple maker who is uh, blessed with an opportunity uh, to interact, to converse, to help, to work, to listen, to all these things, to be able to come alongside someone and make it easier for them to understand not only who you are, but what you offer and how to respond. Father, thank you for the great blessing of your truth in our lives. May we share it this week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and we will invite. We will not close the message without offering that invitation, asking for a response. You know, Not only do you know what Jesus has done, do you know what he offers, but do you know what he asks? You know? And if you're willing to make that response this morning, uh, let's stand together and we'll sing our invitation. <clears throat> Just as you are, hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see, come receive, come and live forever. Come just as you are, hear the Spirit call. Just as you are, come receive Christ the King, come and live forevermore. Life everlasting and strength for today, taste the living water and never. Spirit call, come just as you are, come and see, come receive, come and live forever, come just as you are, hear the Spirit call, come just as you Come receive Christ the King, come and live forevermore. <clears throat> we do invite you to stay this morning, and if you're one of the adults, we, it's, we still have Sunday school. We haven't had it for like three weeks. Um, there are still classes across the foyer and down in the basement, new books down there, but I hope you can stay this morning and be back tonight. I know uh, Steve and Brianna... Derek, who has tonight? I forget. You do? Okay, so Derek will have tonight for the older group. And then trying to think, Bean Dinner Guys is coming up, not this Thursday, right, but a week from Thursday. So about a week and a half left on that. And Easter's about a month away. So be thinking now, hopefully you can come and share in the breakfast in the morning then. Uh, always starts at 7. Sunrise will be at 7, breakfast at 7.30. So uh, not far at all. So anything else we have? Derek, would you be willing to pray for us, please? Thanks. Lord, thank you for this time that we could gather in fellowship and worship. And we pray that as we go through the week, we take the opportunities to take that first step and just notice those around us and where they may be hurting or where they may need you to come into their lives through us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll close this morning by singing, Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Oh Lord, you're beautiful, your grace is all I see, and when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds in me. Oh Lord, you're wonderful, your touch is all I need, and when your hand is on this 
this child your healing I receive. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. And when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds in 